for miles around. Lions, tigers, acrobats, and jugglers, and clowns. Pull on. Tightrope, walkers, pony riders, elephants, and so much more. Guess I got the idea right here at school. Felt like a fool when they called my name. Divided in three like a circuit. Ring one, executive. Two is legislative, that's the Congress. Ring three, judiciary. See, it's kind of like my circus. Circus. Step right up and visit ring number one. The show's just begun. Meet the president. I am here to see that the laws get done. The ringmaster of the government. I got the show. Hurry, hurry, hurry to ring number two. See what they do in the Congress. Pass the laws and juggle and build. Oh, it's quite a thrill in the Congress. Focus your attention on ring number three. The judiciary's in the spotlight. The courts take the laws and they tame the crime. Balancing the wrongs with your rights. No one part can be more powerful than any other is. Each controls the other, you see. And that's what we call checks and balances. Well, everybody's act is part of the show. And no one's job is more important. The audience is kind of like the country, you know. Keeping an eye on their performance. Ring one, executive. Two is legislative, that's Congress. Ring three, judiciary. See? But until I get it, I'll do my thing with government. It's got free. The Constitution of the United States creates the government of the United States. It establishes all the branches of government and the very foundation of our of our government is found in the United States Constitution. The Bill of Rights, uh, what is often referred to as the Second Constitution, discusses the rights of citizens, in essence the relationship of the federal government to the citizens of the United States. The First Constitution, uh, that part that we will spend much of our time on, uh, that part talks about the relationship between, it creates the three branches and talks about the relationship between the branches, the relationship between the federal government, the central government, and the state government, and the relationship to some extent of each state to each state. However, in all of its, um, in all of its brilliance, the Constitution still reflects the fears and the hopes of the people who drafted it and the people who were um, in power in America at that time. The Constitution also reflects the power struggles that they were dealing with, and in particular, the power struggles that were surrounding those areas which embodied their fears and their hopes. And so what we will talk about in this portion is uh, those fears and those hopes again, but also those power struggles and how those who drafted the Constitution went about reaching compromise to make sure that those power struggles were satisfied. You have to remember at this point, we were coming from the Articles of Confederation, a loosely, which created a a loose confederation of states. Each state 
was still thinking of itself as independent, as separate. And now we were trying to form from these states, which had different people, different types of Europeans um, settling in each one, slightly different cultures, had different currency. Now we're trying to form from these different states that often functioned almost as a different nation, except they had come together for a war. Now we're trying to pull together from these different states one nation. And, and therefore, the Constitution had to reach compromise in order to bring these states together. The, the brilliance of the United States Constitution um, is in its simplicity and in, in its brevity uh, and simplicity. And let me, let's talk about that a little bit. The U.S. Constitution is a brief document. It, in fact, is shorter than the North Carolina State Constitution. And when you compare it to the California Constitution, it is a midget compared to the California Constitution, which is, which is volumes larger than the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution has lasted over 130 years, and probably one of the reasons why it has endured is because it, its brevity did allow for the creation of institutions. What our Constitution sought to do was codify concepts into the Constitution. So the concepts of checks and balances were specific enough that they would work in, in, in principle and then it allowed institutions to come up around it so that those institutions could change, evolve, and grow as the democracy changed, evolved, and grow, grew. Um, it meant that our Constitution became a living, breathing document, able to be interpreted consistent with the time and the, the challenges change of, of a changing time. Uh, that um, when constitutions get so specific, it becomes difficult to read into them anything other than the letter of what was uh, written. Our constitution does not have that uh, a large level of specificity. It tries to codify concepts, therefore giving it more flexibility. The Article One of the U.S. Constitution creates the legislative branch. The legislative branch is a bicameral branch, meaning there are two branches of the U.S. Uh, legislative or lawmaking branches, two chambers. Uh, there's the United States House and the United States Senate. Let's talk a little bit about the Senate first. The Senate is made up of uh, 100 people. It is the, um, those 100 people come to from every state. It is not apportioned based upon population. Therefore, it doesn't matter how many people a state has. Every state has two senators. Uh, this then, that, these senators are elected for six years and one-third of the Senate is elected every year. Every, I'm sorry, every two years. One-third of the Senate is, is, is up for re-election every two years. This, the Senate, sometimes called the Millionaire's Club, is called that because because you're running from the entire state, not from a district, but from an entire state, you have to have money and name recognition to be able to run from an entire state. So if you think about it, someone who's a senator from California has to have the name recognition to run statewide. Uh, over that big, large, broad, expansive state as diverse as it is. Someone from New York has to have that exact same, but someone from Rhode Island is a senator also, and they have to run from around for Senate throughout the state of Rhode Island, which is much smaller, uh, has fewer people than, than a borough in New York or uh, fewer people than a, than a county in, in um in California. 
but the Senate is the Millionaires Club because uh, it takes a lot of money to get the name recognition and get the message out to run for the U.S. Senate. Um, they, uh, again, one third of the senators are elected every year. They're 100 senators. That's two from every state, 50 states, 100 senators. In order to be a senator, you have to be at least age 30. You have to uh, have lived in the United States for nine years, have been a citizen of the U.S. for nine years. You can be a naturalized citizen and be in the Senate of the United States. Uh, naturalized, there's no prohibition against the naturalized citizens. You have to, however, live in the state that you are running to be a senator from. You Now, because you have to be a citizen, in some states, that means that you must not be a convicted felon. In uh, states, particularly in the Old South, people who are convicted of felonies are not allowed to be, uh, to be citizens. They can't vote anymore, and therefore they lose their citizenship right. Unless that citizenship right is somehow restored, uh, and that generally is defined by the state law, in the appropriate state, then a person convicted in North Carolina, for example, cannot, if it's convicted of a felony, cannot be a, U, uh, a U.S. senator because they have lost their citizenship unless they've gotten their citizenship restored in accordance with North Carolina statutes. On the other hand, California does not have that same provision. Therefore, since a convicted felon in California doesn't lose their citizenship rights, if they are 30, have lived in the United States for nine years and live in California, they would qualify to be a U.S. senator under um, federal law as applied through California. While the Senate is certainly a chamber in the Congress of the United States, the Senate's duties differ somewhat from the House. Uh, this, the Senate, which started out being elected only by the legislators of the various states, again, uh, you see the fear of popular sovereignty, the fear of popular elections, and therefore, they wanted to make sure the Senate was indeed the chamber of the landed gentry. Uh, there, and, and therefore, they gave the legislature a, an opportunity to, to vet the candidates. That subsequently changed. But the, the, the Senate is a different body from the House. They have uh, certain uh, responsibilities that the House doesn't have. And among those is that they confirm um, nominees, the presidential nominees to the Supreme Court and to the federal judiciary. Um, and that means the Senate has a lot to do with uh, how the makeup of the court, uh, of our federal courts. Uh, the Senate confirms ambassadors. All cabinet members must go before the Senate. Um, to be confirmed in their position as a cabinet member. The Senate votes on um, the treaties um, that uh, are negotiated by the executive branch and the president of the United States. So the Senate has some authority that the, the, the House of Representatives does not have. Now, let's spend a little time talking about the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives is population-based, whereas there are two senators for every uh, state, 
the House is based upon the population of that state. Every state will get at least one member of the House. The, however, there are 435 members of the United States House. They're elected for two-year terms. Therefore, every time there's a federal election, the, the total House of Representatives is up for re-election and can switch and uh, can change parties' hands. Doesn't happen, but can uh, theoretically happen. Um, there are many small states like Delaware and Alaska and Rhode Island that actually have more members of the U.S. Senate than they have House. Because you may have, in those states, you have only one member in the House because they're so small in their population. To be a member of the House, you have to be age 25, at least age 25. You have to be a citizen of the United States for at least seven years. You can be a naturalized citizen or you can be a um, native born citizen. Uh, you, again, the rules about being a convict are going to vary from state to state and they are the same rules that we've discussed when we talked about the Senate. However, Whereas in the Senate, you have to live in the state that you represent. In the House, you do not have to live in the district that you represent. You do have to live in the state that the district you represent is, is, um, is in. So if you represent a, the, the, the 13th Congressional District of North Carolina, you have to live in North Carolina. But you could live in the 1st Congressional District of North Carolina and still represent the 13th District of North Carolina. In fact, Congressman Walter Jones could not get elected in the 1st District, a predominantly black, strongly Democratic district. He lived in the 1st Congressional District, ran for another Congressional District as a Republican, won that district, and has subsequently moved to that district, but in fact did not live in the district when he uh, first was elected uh, to be a member of that, to be representative from that district. The um, the House has roughly the same powers of the Senate, except for those special powers of confirmation and advice and consent on special appointments. But otherwise, it has the same basic rules. What do you see? Why was I, there a need for a House and a Senate? Well, it was a basically a compromise. The small states were worried and feared about the power of the big states. And if you went based on population, then the big states would have a significant uh, amount of power in the House of Representatives, and the small states would have very little power in that House. And therefore, in the crafting of laws, they would not be uh, as influential. The large states, on the other hand, didn't want equal representation because they were saying, my people deserve more power. We have more people. My people, therefore, deserve more power. And so the compromise was to give a Senate to the small states. The small states would then have a body which could oversee or at least be a stopgap against um, the more raucous and rowdy House. Um, and, and therefore, they would have this, the Senate would review anything that the House passed and therefore could, could block it should it be something that hurts the small states. And in, in the Senate, the small states have as much representation as the large states. So they are, um, I, I, to some extent, disproportionately, certainly in terms of population, disproportionately represented in the Senate. On the House side, the large states now have a body, a, a, a unit uh, that they are represented to the full extent of their population. And as a result, they have more influence in the House. Large states have more influence in the House than the small states do. This was the battle. And what you're seeing is, in the creation of a House and a Senate, uh, the compromise between the large states and the small states uh, to ensure that power is shared and that both both large states and small states could join the union. A final thing that needs to be said about the legislative branch, and it's true about the federal legislative branch and the state legislative branch. 
and that is um, the legislative branch, um, just as the king could do no wrong, they did adopt a little bit of that in the legislative branch. Uh, and so legislators, while in session and in the commission of their duties, can make statements that otherwise would be defamatory, otherwise would allow them to be sued, otherwise may even allow them to, to get arrested. They can make those statements. As long as those statements aren't treasonous, trying to overthrow the government of the United States, legislators can make those statements and they are protected. I have had instances in which legislators um, were talking to me and these are legislators that didn't particularly like me. And those legislators made statements that, in fact, I reminded them that they should be happy they said them on the floor of the House or in the chambers and of deliberation in the House because those statements so false were so false and so untrue that they may um, reek of defamation and could result in, in um some form of defamation lawsuit that uh, never did not in, uh, ingratiate me with that member of the uh, house that I told that to, but I wasn't going to be ingratiated with them anyway. They didn't like me, and that's why they made the statement, and I didn't like them, and that's why I gave them the salvo that they better not make that statement any other place, or I would um, do what I could to um, bully them around just as they were trying to bully me around. Now we've talked about the, the bodies that make up the, the legislative branch and what the qualifications are to be in the legislative branch, but let's talk about what they do. The Constitution clearly spells out the duties of the legislative branch, and that legislative branch is to make laws. Uh, they, making laws is, more, is a little more important than we sometimes give it credit for. Because making laws means you're setting the agenda, the national agenda. And the reason why you have an elected um, legislature is because they're setting the national agenda. They need to be um, close to the people so that they understand those needs, those fears and hopes that should go on to the national agenda, should be a part of the policy making agenda and national agenda uh, in front of the nation. So it is so it is important that we understand that making laws isn't just a process of of passing some words. It's a a process of crafting legislation able to to reach the compromises necessary to amass the correct number of votes, and in essence, it sets the national policy and sets the national agenda. The legislative branch appropriates money. It sets the budget. By setting the budget, it again sets the priorities of the nation. If uh, someone says that an item is a priority, but yet it is not in the budget, it's not a priority. Um, and so the legislative branch can, in fact, um, appropriate money for education one year and not appropriate any money the next year because education is a political matter and if education is off the national agenda then it's off the national agenda. People have often wondered well why is money disproportionately spent on trying to cure heart disease and that money is not spent on other diseases such as cervical cancer? Well because the national agenda has sets a higher priority on heart disease. And that's because those linking mechanisms, those people, um, institutions, newspapers, and others that set up, that help uh, formulate the national agenda, bring thing, bringing things to elected leaders' attention and help bring it to the national agenda, they have spent more time and they are more lobbyists designed um, or, or focused on on one disease versus the other. Now sometimes it can be simply said that well general members of the 
Uh, the legislature tend to get that disease more often. That's true. That may be a linking mechanism that gets something on the agenda that doesn't get other diseases on the agenda. But needless to say, the appropriation of money is an important role of the, of the legislative branch that helps set the national agenda. As I've said in earlier, the earlier part of this lecture, um, immigration is, requires a uniform scheme. You can't have immigration laws for one state versus immigration laws for another state. People are immigrating to the U.S., and therefore there should be a uniform scheme of immigration. And it's clearly set out in the Constitution that Congress will set forth the immigration regulations for the United States. Congress sets up the post office and the road system, and that's the reason why you have a series of U.S. highways and interstate highways, because the Constitution sets forth um, what the founders of this nation were designing, were intending to do, was create a one nation, and the best way of creating one nation is to have people able to move from one area to another so that they could feel as though they were indeed one nation. Uh, just made up of several states. The regulation of interstate commerce and transportation was uh, is something that again is a legislative branch because what you want to be able to do is ensure that goods can be moved from one state to another and that goods meet certain safety rules and that goods can be transported. It particularly talks about uh, and with Indian tribes, because Indian tribes at this time, if those Indian tribes were not taxed, were not, uh, were on the reservation, were not what we, and I'm going to use this term, civilized, meaning Christian and, and off the reservation, then those Indian tribes, and by definition, they were not uh, civilized. By definition, then, those Indian tribes were not a part of the United States. And as a result of not being a part of the United States, Congress had to pass laws on how to uh, engage in commerce with these foreign nations within the borders of the United States. The uh, Congress has the power to, um, to raise uh, up an army and a navy, and in fact, we do. Um, and when we say armies, we don't necessarily mean the arm, U.S. Army. It means those who would be in armed forces. Um, and, and Congress has the right to declare war. Only Congress can declare war. The president cannot declare war. Um, the, um, in the history of this nation, there's only been two wars declared, World War I and World War II. Those other battles that we've been fighting in, Vietnam, Korea, Iraq, Afghanistan, are not wars. They are uh, international conflicts. They are uh, other things, but they are not wars. While Congress may support them by sending money to the troops, they have not declared a war. The president, uh, and there's always been some battle between the president and Congress, because the president who says I'm commander-in-chief and by constitution is the commander-in-chief, the president um, s seeks to wage war, uh, but Congress says only we can declare war, and so there's some skirmish over who has uh, the, f the ability to commit U.S. troops to war. Uh, generally speaking, because uh, things occur rapidly, you want to have the president with the ability to commit U.S. troops to, to a battlefield, but you also want Congress to have the ability to determine whether this, is, uh, this battle is of the nature that we would want to commit U.S. troops to. And so there's this delicate balance of uh, 
who can commit them and how long can the president commit them if he can commit them and must the Congress then send money to a war that they do not that they have not necessarily declared a war um, the War Powers Act sought to clarify that no president has uh, recognized the limitations thereof and I'm not going to be able to answer those questions if they have uh, questions about the War Powers Act and the War Powers of the President have been asked over and over again. Uh, they've not been answered yet. Um, basically, presidents have been given leeway uh, to, um, to commit U.S. troops. They always try to consult with the Senate and the House, um, even though they don't necessarily say that they can, they have to submit to the War Powers Act. This Constitution still reflects the, the fears and the hopes of those who were drafting it. And what you see in the creation of the legislative branch was the fear of an unbridled lit Congress, a Congress able to abuse power. And so the drafters of the Constitution gave them the right to make laws, but then said, there's some laws you can't make. There's some, some things, some legal provisions that you cannot, um, you cannot do anything about unless you change the Constitution, which requires um, a significant um, action in order to do that. And so in uh, Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution, they limit the powers of Congress to make certain laws. If you look at that section, you see um, Congress can't suspend the writ of habeas corpus. Uh, now, habeas corpus, literal translation, means deliver the body. What it basically is saying is that uh, what would happen is the king would um, arrest someone, uh, not charge him with anything, just leave him in jail. He knew he couldn't convict him of anything, so the way he got around it was just arrested him and never brought him to trial. And they would have to, in the common law, England would have to issue a writ of habeas corpus, meaning deliver the body. We want the person delivered out of jail, and either you put him on trial or you're not, or you can't, or you let him go. Um, and what um, this article of the U.S. Constitution says is. Congress can't do away with the writ of habeas corpus. That's a common law writ. We're going to continue that. We're not going to allow you, in essence, to put someone away in jail and not give them a trial. Now, I guess as I say this, people are thinking, well, what about Guantanamo, where George Bush uh, put um, enemy combatants in Guantanamo Bay, which is in Cuba, I might add. Uh, and uh, didn't give them a trial, or is going to give them uh, a military tribunal. Um, and I would add that most times when the issue has come before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has basically said the writ of habeas corpus is going to apply, and you have to give these people trials, and uh, hasn't said exactly what these trials have to constitute, but they've uh, ruled in the favor of these enemy combatants in terms of their constitutional rights. One of the things George was trying to do was say they're not on American soil so they don't get all the American rights that otherwise a citizen would get. And that's uh, sort of helped him out just a little bit every once in a while, but by and large it's not helped him out uh, significantly. And therefore these um, enemy combatants are entitled to habeas corpus. Um, and while people will like to politicize it, um, it is it was brought over from those revered people who drafted the Constitution, brought over from the common law of England. So it isn't some liberal um, reading of the Constitution or some liberal construct that people would want to make it out to be. It is a part of the of the fabric of uh, and the values that this nation has long held on to. We also um, have a provision in section in sec Article One, Section Nine, that says there can be no bill of attainers. And a bill of attainer, as we've explained, is a bill which a legislative enactment which is so specific 
that it only um, impacts uh, a few individuals and it is likely to say that this bill was passed because of you. It was a, is, is a bill of attainer. I believe when, when we get into the Terry Schiavo case, we'll find that they've probably, that the Congress probably engaged in passing a bill of attainer there, that it was mainly pointed, a, while it talked broadly, it was mainly pointed at one particular case. Um, ex post facto, you cannot pass a law that makes something illegal that wasn't illegal when it was done. You can't pass a law backwards. Uh, so if something was done on day one and you pass the law on day four, you cannot make wh what was done on day one illegal as a result of an action done on day four. It can be illegal from day four on forward, but not backwards, ex post facto. Um, the the, this article of the Constitution doesn't allow Congress to pass titles of nobility. So there can't be any dukes and earls and princesses and queens in the United States. Uh, there was, again, the fear of this nobility and these nobility taking over and, and exerting their powers. Remember, nobility was thought to be governing by as a result of divine right, meaning they were ordained by God to be the king and the queen and the leaders. And if you create that nobility, it's kind of hard to have a popular uh, democracy, a sovereign democracy, because nobility, uh, someone who's anointed by God to do certain things, certainly doesn't have to listen to the um, votes of, um, of, of a bunch of rabble-rousing, uh, uneducated people who don't have... Um, who haven't been vetted through um, the heavenly vetting process, uh, as they would claim. The um, Article 1, Section 9 also prohibits Congress from passing laws which give certain states preferences. Um, interstate Commerce provision says you're not going to give certain states preferences uh, in under this Constitution. Uh, there was a case in which Ohio passed a, a law um, that um, gave its mud flap, made all trucks driving uh, through Ohio have to use certain mud flaps. Those mud flaps were only made by a company in Ohio and what it would mean is a, uh, um, a state could indeed pass various laws which would require truck drivers to stop and change mud flaps in every state in order to have mud flaps which complied with that state. And the, and the Supreme Court said, no, that is too intrusive into interstate commerce. You cannot stop interstate commerce or hinder interstate commerce in that way, and therefore they outlawed it. Well, Congress can't do that either. Congress can't pass laws which give a preference to a particular state or uh, over another state. By the word preference, I mean uh, Congress cannot give an advantage to one state over another state. Article 1, which deals with the the apportionment of uh, representatives in the House of Representatives has been much maligned and, and probably for uh, the wrong reason, even though it certainly does um, emphasize and, and is the specific provision which gives uh, some notion as to who is included in the Constitution and who is excluded in the Constitution. Many of the um, arguments uh, about this particular provision are misguided. Let's talk a little bit about that. The Senate obviously has no concern about the population of a state or a district. Uh, two senators are uh, attributed to every state no matter what the population is. But the House cares about uh, the district. In fact, 
um, the number of House of House of Representative members is apportioned according to the population. Therefore, at the founding of the Constitution, you needed to know what the population of a particular state was in order to determine how many House of Representative um, members would be apportioned to that state. You still do that. We do it every time we do a census every 10 years. As a result of this requirement, the um, drafters of the Constitution had to therefore determine who was going to be counted. And in making the determination of who was going to be counted, you in essence began to determine who would be included in this new democracy, who would be counted as citizens in the new democracy. When um, you look at the specific provision in Article 1, you see that it counted as whole people, one to one, the free people within the boundaries of the United States. Now, by free people, you primarily were talking about uh, Caucasian men. Um, while it doesn't say women, uh, doesn't say women are excluded, you're counting women uh, because women are indeed counted for this purpose, but they were not going to be given the right to vote uh, at this point. But indeed, for the uh, determination of congressional distribution, free people did include women. Um, you included uh, those bound in for indentured servitude for a period of years. That generally would have been um, those poor, generally white, who came to the country as a result of uh, indentured servitude. Generally what was happening was they did not have enough money to pay their passage and what someone would do would be they, I will pay your passage but you will then have to work for me uh, for a certain number of years to pay back that passage. It was not quite slavery, but it was the closest thing to white slavery that the nation had. And, and it was not um, a pleasant status to be in because these people were bound to work for the entity that um, bought them or their passage to the new world. Uh, but it included those people who were generally white. Um, it excluded, however, Indians that were not taxed. Native Americans who were not taxed, Native Americans who were still living on the reservation, therefore wouldn't be taxed. Uh, Native Americans who were not civilized in, in the sort of pejorative way they use that term would would not be included in the uh, nation uh, because remember if they were living on a reservation they were not citizens of the United States they were citizens of that nation whatever the nation was that the reservation they were living on so if they were Cherokee living on a Cherokee reservation they were citizens of the Cherokee nation not of the United States they could become citizens of the United States by coming off the reservation um, becoming Christians and, and and following a prescribed path that was certainly further described by Congress but they would not be citizens if they were Indians that were not taxed um, then it said three-fifths of all other persons. Those all other persons were generally the black people. Black people who were slaves. Uh, the slaves were, were counted three-fifths of them. Now, many times we argue that, well, they were saying that we were three-fifths of a person. No, they aren't saying that you're three-fifths of a person as uh, slaves. They were saying that they're only going to count three out of every five slaves. This was an argument over power, not an argument over human rights. Basically what the South was asserting was we want to count all of our slaves because they are people. And by counting all of our slaves because they are people, it increases our population. Therefore, it increases the number of members we have in the House of Representatives over the North and it increases our power. On the other hand, the North was saying, oh no, we're not going to count the slaves as 
hold people because you claim them to be property south and therefore by decreasing the number of people in the south they decreased the number of representatives that the south has increasing the power that the north would have over the south and therefore this was a power struggle not a struggle over human rights and what the compromise was well we will not count them one for one but we will count three every three we will count as three people every five slaves that that's the issue and so when you hear hear the argument about they counted us as three-fifths of a man that is not exactly the um, the truth it, they were counting they were only counting three out of every five slaves because the north was saying i do not want the south to acquire political power based upon property that they also say are people the south is being disingenuous by calling it them property one time and people the next time and the north is being disingenuous by saying these are people for one purpose but now saying but we're not going to count them for another purpose this was a struggle over power According to the Constitution, the executive power of uh, the United States is vested in the president and the vice president. Uh, the president and the vice president are, in fact, the only two nationally elected offices. No other office in the United States is elected by all of the people of the United States, with the exception of the president and vice president. The vice president has a unique role. The vice president is vice president serving um, as the person who, uh, as sort of the president in wait, uh, there to serve if the president is incapacitated or dies in office. But the vice president also serves as the president of the Senate. He presides or she presides over the Senate and the vice president um, is um, votes in case of a tie in the um, in the Senate. Now, the executive power of the United States is vested in the president and the vice president, primarily in the president of the United States, who has a number of roles. The president is elected for four years. Every four years, the president has to stand for re-election. The president can only succeed himself or herself one time. That is a result of an amendment because, as, you, as most people will know, Roosevelt succeeded himself more than more than twice, um, and 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 therefore post-Roosevelt, they put term limits so the president could serve no longer than eight years. The president must be 35 years old or older and has to be a natural-born citizen. Cannot be born um, and naturalized an American. Has to be born a natural-born citizen. Doesn't mean he has to be born in the United States. Americans can only have Americans. So an American born in Timbuktu can be, if he's born to an American citizen, is an American whether born in Timbuktu or not. Uh, only, Americans can only have Americans. And therefore, um, you can be a natural born citizen even though you were not born in the um on territory owned by the United States or in a state, but if you were born to American parents, you would be a natural born citizen. You have to also be a resident for 14 years in order to be the President of the United States. Now, the um, President of the United States serves as the Chief Executive of the um, Executive Branch all those agencies um, and and regulatory bodies of the federal government uh, fall within the uh, authority or under the authority of the president of the United States he directs them uh, sets forth their agenda uh, allocate and and uh, administers 
generally appoints their heads and administers um, their um, their agenda and their programs via through his uh, appointed representatives. Uh, the president. Um, these these agencies set up a number of uh, regulations that control a number a large portion of our daily lives or a large portion of how agencies um, operate he administers the budget though congress um, votes on the budget the president has to administer the president has to spend that money and use the money in a way that he that is consistent with the congressional mandate but also uh, consistent with the president's agenda and the president's uh, desires the president has um, a hiring of staff as an entire personnel office that hires thousands and thousands of people in the federal bureaucracy and therefore he has jobs to hand out all over the United States so the president is um, is a very powerful position that should not be um, minimized as the chief of state the president is also the chief ambassador um, setting a, he, he determines the foreign policy and and negotiates treaties for for the nation uh, the president is the official representative of this nation when we um, go abroad the president is the chief legislator the president is the one that proposes new laws and actually proposes the budget the president also has the authority to veto laws part of the checks and balances power of the president is to be able to veto laws that he does not agree with um, the president also are used by bush the, the president also had um, the power of signing statements now these signing statements are controversial because there's nothing in the constitution that gives the president the right to use signing statements but under President Bush, he would use signing statements which would tell how he intended to interpret the law written by Congress. In many instances, when Bush would make a determination and write a signing statement about how he intended to interpret the law, some of those signing statements basically said, I intend to do something exactly opposite of what the Congress said. Uh, those signing statements were clearly, according to the American Bar Association, in violation of the Constitution and in violation of the law, uh, but also according to the American Bar Association, no one had the standing or the right to file a lawsuit um, under um, our Constitution and therefore, uh, while, while improper, it was a legal wrong without a way of redressing or obtaining a remedy. The uh, president, so the president does stand as the chief legislator because the president sets for proposes laws proposes the budget administers the budget and therefore creates the legislative agenda for the nation he the president further creates the legislative agenda and the policy agenda for the nation by using his bully pulpit anywhere the president goes the president brings attention to issues and therefore the president by bringing attention by bringing media and other uh, lobby groups and others focusing on an issue the president can bring attention and move something propel an issue onto the national agenda i.e. health care reform by President Obama green jobs by President Obama all of these uh, issues that were important to him he has engaged in a number of uh, speeches and events which focus the nation's attention in this area and therefore he has moved it to the national agenda making him legislator in chief but also advocate in chief uh, when John Kennedy wanted to um, uh, or I'm sorry when Lyndon Johnson uh, dealt with the issue of integration he came on to the the um, the news or to the and the news media uh, right after he had ordered the integration of schools 
uh, and spoke about the unfairness, basically using his bully pulpit to to try to talk the nation into the moral to into the moral high grounds of integrating our of our schools. That again is a part of the president's advocacy role. The president can bring attention and can stake out a ground uh, advocating for the nation to move to that higher ground and galvanizing support behind that higher ground. The president is the commander in chief, which means that the president is the head of the armed forces, armed forces of the United States. Um, the United States is unique. We have a civilian to head our armed forces, a civilian who may or may not have military experience. Uh, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, neither had military uh, experience. George Bush had some limited military experience, even though he spent most of his time um, trying to avoid going to the military. Um, but um, we have a civilian leader of our uh, armed forces. That means in the commander in chief role is a is a unique role because that is the one role in which when the president is commanding our troops commanding and talking to the generals trying to make decisions that while people may say some things and criticize they have to pretty much uh give way to his opinion because that is the constitution recognizes that when in battle or when engaged in some kind of conflict. The president does not have time to consult with Congress. The president does not need to lead people in battle by consensus that decisions have to be made rapidly and that there needs to be just one voice, one leader leading the generals um, and other admirals that lead our armed forces. And so it gives the president a unique set of powers. Uh, the one place where the Constitution does allow the concentration and focus of power is in the president in his role as commander-in-chief. The president in that um, instance is um, leading in exigent circumstances and in those instances they're not asking the president to, to build um, consensus but they're asking the president to act. And, um, and therefore the commander-in-chief role becomes a, a, a very solitary role, but a solitary role in which the president has um, power to do things that otherwise in other roles, advocate as legislator, as chief of state representing the nation, as chief executive officer, in those instances he's got to consult. He has a number of, there are a number of checks and balances. Commander in chief, those checks and balances go off because it's a recognition of the exigent circumstances in which uh, or the special circumstances in which the president then walks in to be the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. One of the roles of the president that tends to last beyond his presidency is uh, his ability to nominate federal judges. Uh, he nominates federal judges from the Supreme Court to district court judges and in those instances those judges sit for life or good behavior. Um, therefore presidents, um, Nixon still has judges who are sitting on the uh, federal judiciary. Uh, presidents long after their death still are impacting at least how the law is interpreted and how policy is interpreted in the nation. The president also nominates his cabinet. He nominates the um, ambassadors of this nation. Uh, so the president's role, appointive powers uh, allow him to have power far beyond just the immediate touch of the executive branch of government. Now let's talk about the Electoral College. That institution is much maligned, particularly after the Bush v. Gore debacle. Uh, but let's talk about why this institution existed. Uh, the Electoral College was actually a compromise with the small states. Let's think about it. Uh, the, the number of electors is defined by 
two senators plus the number of representatives you have. Therefore, every small state has at least three um, members of the Electoral College because every small state gets at least one member of the House of Representatives and every, small, every state gets two senators. Small states, in fact, are disproportionately represented because senators um, do not, are not apportioned according to population. Small states are disproportionately represented in the Electoral College because they actually have more votes than their proportionate share of the population. So what that does is it means that small states have more influence as a result of this, even though large states are very important because they put together large blocks of electoral votes, small states are disproportionately represented in amongst the electors in the Electoral College, meaning you can't just discount them. What the Electoral College does, it creates 50 different elections. Instead of an election that is overall of the United States, the, the majority of U.S. citizens, it's the majority of states. The majority of state electors may be the better way of saying it. You have 50 different state elections, and what has to happen is you have to get the majority of electoral votes. That means you can't discount the small states because those small states are disproportionately represented. Remember, the president is not the president of necessary of the is the president of the United States. He is the president of the state states of this union and as a result the president has to acquire the votes of the states those the votes of the states are cast by the electoral college it gives small states a greater voice but because it also has the represent number of representatives in there it gives great large states even greater voice. While the small states are disproportionately represented, that mean they have more electoral votes than their population would dictate. The large states certainly have large number blocks of electoral votes and become more important for a presidential candidate to try to secure on their side. Now, what does does this mean that people who have uh, the majority of the vote sometimes lose the um, the election? Yes, because what happens is while they may have a runaway victory in certain large states, they have not acquired the votes in enough states that would give them electoral majority in what this constitution is basically saying is we want someone who is a consensus among all of the states of the union not necessarily someone who is a consensus among all the people of the union uh, because uh, we are again the president of the united states of america and and therefore the president needs to be able to um, to run a credible campaign in the states, or certainly in the majority of states. And so the, it sort of reaches that compromise between the small state, large state, and also makes sure that the president runs a credible candidate. You have a credible president um, who has support amongst the several states of the union. Every four years, Americans who are 18 or older have a big responsibility. Our votes decide who becomes the President of the United States. Unfortunately, the U.S. election system isn't that simple. This is electing a U.S. President in plain English. It's easy to imagine every U.S. citizen's vote being counted together on Election Day, but this is not the case. U.S. elections are not decided by the total or popular vote, but individual states. Let me explain. It starts with your vote. 
On election day, you'll vote for president and their vice president. You get one choice. Then, all the votes in your state are counted. The candidate with the most statewide votes becomes the candidate your state supports for president. This happens across the country until each state has selected their candidate. We end up with most of the 50 states and the District of Columbia voting to support one candidate each. But there's a problem. We can't elect a president by just counting up the choices of these states. U.S. states are different. Consider this. California has about 36 million people. Kansas has less than 3 million. We need a way for California's choice to have more influence on the election because the state has more people. The question becomes, how do we make sure each state has the right amount of influence on the election? Well, we need a way to account for the population of each state. As an example, let's consider my home state of North Carolina. Like every state, it is divided up into congressional districts that are based on population. North Carolina has 13 districts, California has 53, and Kansas has 4. When it comes to a state's influence on the election, the number of districts matters most. More population equals more districts equals more influence. The influence a state has in the election is measured by the number of electors. This number comes from the number of districts in a state plus the number of U.S. Senators, which is always two. North Carolina has 15 electors, while California has 55. When a candidate wins the voting in a state, they win that state's number of electors. That's why big, populous states can be so important to candidates. Their electors add up quickly, and the number of electors is what really matters. Here's why. If you add up the electors of all 50 states in the District of Columbia, there are 538 in total. The candidate's goal on election day is to win the majority of 538, or 270 electors. Once a candidate wins enough states to reach the 270 majority, they have won the election and become the president-elect. Yay! So, let's recap. Your vote helps your state choose a single candidate. That candidate receives all the electors from your state. The candidate who can win enough states to reach 270 total electors wins the national election and becomes the president-elect. Then, on the following January 20th, the president-elect is sworn in as the next president of the United States. And it all starts with your vote. Make it count. The Constitution of the United States, States sets up the Supreme Court and several federal courts uh, inferior to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court is um, the court that is of last resort. It is comprised of nine justices. The Chief Justice is the head of the judicial branch of the United States. The Chief Justice of uh, the Supreme Court currently is John Roberts. Uh, he was appointed by um, Bush the son uh, just recently. There are 13 circuit courts of appeals. These courts hear uh, cases appeal from the lower federal uh, district courts uh, and the cases appealed from these courts will generally go to the Supreme Court of uh, the United States. There are 94 circuit court justices or court of appeals justices um, and these justices um, like Supreme Court justices serve for life and just like a federal district court judge they serve for life. The reason for serving for life means that these justices no longer have to engage in politics. They are immune from the political pressures that can come, come sometimes come from making decisions that are politically unpopular but consistent with the law. Uh, they serve for life or good behavior. And that is, if a judge does something improper, then the judge can be impeached and be removed. And every once in a while, judges have been impeached. Alcee Hastings was impeached in Florida. Uh, the ir irony is he was impeached. He then ran for Congress, won a congressional seat, and now sits in Congress. The same body that impeached him. Um, the 
role of the court is to preserve the rights as guaranteed under the Constitution to interpret the laws of the nation and they have the power to of judicial review to declare a law constitutional or unconstitutional the there are um, 94 district courts in the United States and these district courts are basically the trial court division for the federal for the federal court and they will hear federal trials both criminal and civil there are a number of specialized courts bankruptcy courts the federal court of claims the international the court of international trade these are courts that are all again federal judges these judges are appointed by the president of the united states and um, generally confirmed by the senate um, but these are this is what these are the courts that the judicial power of the united states is vested in While the word education isn't mentioned in the United States Constitution, the word treason is mentioned several times. Let me explain why. One, education wasn't mentioned because education was not considered to be a public right at that point. Uh, most people went to private uh, religious schools and education was thought to be for the privileged. Therefore, it is not a right guaranteed by the federal constitution we'll have discussions about where that right is guaranteed you but it isn't in this federal constitution in fact the word education if you google it is not going to be in uh, the constitution the federal constitution at all the word treason is and what happened was the king in many in many instances would accuse some of treason with very little evidence very little very few witnesses and therefore would then um, punished them severely as a result of uh, allegations of treason. Uh, the writers of the Constitution were very leery of that. They recognized that treason was an important um, crime that needed to be punished, particularly for a floundering young nation, but they also wanted to make sure that th there was an abuse of that power. And so what, um, so while uh, they certainly recognized treason as a crime. They even limited the judicial branch's power, again, as a result of this fear of power. They limited the judicial branch's power to convict someone of treason. And there's only one crime, in fact, in which the, the Constitution starts specifying what has to be there in order to uh, convict a person of a crime. In fact, um, so in fact, um, this they wanted to guard against the abuse of power even by the judiciary as they were beginning to assess a person's guilt or innocence. And so you have here limitations on how a person can be convicted as treason and you find that in article 3 of the constitution which establishes establishes the judicial branch of government now the full faith and credit clause uh, sounds real ominous but basically what it says is you're going each state is going to recognize the judicial acts and the laws of the the other state uh, basically what you can't have is a state court making uh, one decision and then someone being able to run to any of the other states and say let's start again uh, what basically it allows a person to do is if they run to another state you're able to take the judgment from the prior state that had proper jurisdiction take it to the new state and say execute on this judgment uh, I don't have to litigate this over again. It says one state will recognize the other state's actions. That is going to be an interesting um, situation. Um, just as uh, back in the day when some states, when st states in the north recognized um, uh, marriages between uh, people of different races, and the states in the South had anti-miscegenation statutes which did not recognize marriages between people of different races. Uh, there were questions about whether this marriage, whether when married in New York, 
as a black and white couple couple would it be a valid marriage in Virginia um, I think the loving v Virginia answered that question when it outlawed uh, these anti miscegenation statutes so that uh, that it was not it was not constitutional to have statutes which prohibited people from of different races from being married but you're going to have that same kind of issue as states now uh, adopt in a hodgepodge fashion um, recognition of same-sex marriages if one state recognizes a same-sex marriage will that same-sex marriage be recognized in a state that in fact does not recognize a same-sex marriage if one state recognizes a same-sex marriage and those and that couple has adopted a child and that child is now considered to be the legitimate heir of the of the couple um, both men uh, then when they move to North Carolina and the men die will that child then be able to inherit the land of that couple via intestate succession if this were a male and a female and if it they were married and both died the child would inherit whether they had a will or not is that child going to be given the exact same rights um, in this new state that doesn't recognize the marriage that gave rise to that child's um, adoption or creation that's that's an issue um, the full faith and credit clause will come into play whether or not the states have to give full faith and credit to uh, these marriages or to these uh, kinds of arrangements um, generally speaking the law does not allow um, does not in, in essence excuse my language but this is what we use in the law does not make a child once legitimated a bastard when he moves to another state and therefore the child would have the same rights under one state as they would have under another state uh, or your status at least is determined by the state um, that you were in at the time the status began and if you were in a state that gave you status then you can't if you leave it uh, you still leave that state then you still leave with the status that you had and you can't be put in a worse status as a result of it um, the privileges and immunities clause is a clause which basically says that citizens of one state uh, have, can move to move to other states and and, and therefore they have no um, and, and you have a right to your citizenship rights allow you to to move from one state to another um, the uh, the Article 4, which deals with state government and the relationship of the federal government to the state government, also says that every state has to have a republic form of government. What that basically means is every state has to have a representative democracy. You've every In every state, you must have the ability to vote for those people who will represent you in government. You cannot have a state in the United States that creates a monarchy. You cannot have a state in the United States that has a dictatorship of any sort you have to have a republic um, so that people have the right to elect people again that's uh, sort of the federal government's relationship to the states the constitution uh, was written with the fears and hopes of a founding writers um, in mind and it reflects those basically the Constitution however was brilliant in the checks and balances that it that it and safeguards that it uh, instituted and enshrined it was designed to prevent the abuse of power by spreading the power out preventing the abuse of power by not having a concentration of power and by having checks on any branch says power therefore every branch has some form of check over the other branch and that was one of the brilliance of the United States Constitution the executive branch 
had the ability to propose laws. That was one of its checks. It had the ability, however, to veto laws, so it had to check over Congress because it could stop a law that um, that it did not, that the executive branch did not like. It had the ability to negotiate foreign treaties and to appoint judges. Therefore, it one of its checks over the judiciary is that it could appoint judges to help influence or sway the judiciary and to see policy and law in the way that the executive branch uh, wanted policy and law to, to be seen, even though a judge once nominated could act independently, the, um, the president vetted their judges and still vets their judges well so that they know their judicial temperament and their judicial leanings. And the, uh, another check in the, under the Constitution is uh, the president can grant pardons to uh, federal offenders. Therefore, even if the judicial branch finds someone guilty, the president has the authority to grant a pardon. So there, again, is a check that the uh, executive branch has over the judicial branch. The legislative branch has checks over the other branches because the legislative branch has the power to override the president's veto. So if the president doesn't like something that the legislative branch does, the president can veto it. But the legislative branch has the right to override that veto with a two-thirds vote of the body. Uh, the legislative branch via the Senate has the right to confirm treaties and via the Senate the right to confirm appointments. So the president doesn't have unbridled authority to just appoint people to offices, to judgeships and others. The legislative branch has the right to determine whether those people meet the criteria and to confirm them. Uh, the legislative branch has the ability to impeach federal officers including judges that the president appoints and can impeach federal officers including judges that are in office and not acting up to the standard uh, of uh, good behavior um, and in fact as I said they've done that before um, in fact the Congress can completely dissolve a division of the of the lower federal courts they cannot do away with the supreme court because that is a constitutional court but uh, all the other lower courts are optional with the discretion of congress and they can just do away with them um, and the legislative branch obviously has the ability to enact laws which is a major and significant power of the the legislative branch Checks built into the system for a judicial branch are quite obvious. The judicial branch can declare acts of Congress unconstitutional. They can declare acts of the executive branch unconstitutional. They can declare laws unconstitutional. They can declare regulations promulgated by the um, executive branch inconsistent with law or unconstitutional, inconsistent with the Constitution. They can declare acts of state legislature unconstitutional. Uh, they can declare acts of, uh, they can reverse acts of the judiciary of state legislatures that are interpreting the Constitution or a federal law. They cannot enact a law. Uh, therefore, uh, when a case or controversy is brought before them, the 
judicial branch has the authority to basically interpret the law. They do not have the authority to add provisions or subtract provisions as written unless they find that those provisions are in violation of the Constitution of the United States. But that gives them their checks on the other system. The check the president has on the judiciary is he gets to appoint or she gets to appoint the members of the judiciary. The check the legislature has is any time the judiciary interprets the law in a way that it does not want it, it has the authority to just go and change the law so that the language is clearer um, or change the law in such a way that it can pass constitutional muster if that's possible.